Hi, the title of my talk is from Wii mode to role mode. And what I want to uh, do is make a case for a version of the mode approach to collective intentionality, the subject mode approach, as I call it, over its rivals like the content and the subject approach. And I want to extend the mode approach from Wii mode to role mode to account for what I call role intentionality that is acting, perceiving, knowing, asserting, directing in roles, particularly institutional roles, like being various kinds of officials and professional roles. And then I want to present five theses about role mode. Now, there's the content approach, which attempts to reduce collective intentionality to I intentionality plus specific contents in the sense of what subjects intend or believe. And I also call this SOA or object content. Then there's a mode approach according to which plural subjects are ontologically reducible, but the we mode is conceptually irreducible. And that is rejected by the subject approach which says plural subjects are ontologically irreducible and they are constituted through joint commitment on one view, Margaret Gilbert's view, or to be reflective plural self-awareness on Bernard Schmidt's view. Now, the subject mode account, to understand it, we have to begin at the individual level with the idea that self and object consciousness are inextricably linked and there's a certain tradition of thinkers who have thought that, that reaches from at least Kant to contemporaries like Jose Luis Bermudez. And so the idea is we are never just the way of object, but we are always the object, the way of object in relation to ourselves and are aware of our position relative to these objects in various respects, spatial, temporal, epistemic, volitionary, volitional, and we are aware of these objects and our position relative to them on different levels. And we apply different representational means and formats. On the preconceptual level, we have perceptional, actional, and emotional experience. On the conceptual level, we have beliefs, intentions, spoken language, and the documental le level, we find written language and various forms of documentation. Then the next step uh, is a pretty momentous step of rejecting the force or mode content dichotomy by ascribing content representing the subject's position to modes or force indicators. That is, on this view, for example, an asserting subject presents itself as knowing what is the case or directing subject as knowing what to do. And accordingly, we have position content representing the subject's position and subject content representing the subject itself. Now on this perspective, groups can be understood in terms of subjects experiencing and representing each other as co-subjects of position towards the world. And again, this happens on different levels or layers. On the preconceptual level, we find various relations of joint attention, action, attunement, and effect that connects subject as co-subjects. On the conceptual level, we have shared intentions, beliefs, values, theoretical and practical knowledge. At the documental level, such things as shared contracts, constitutions, legal frameworks, instructions, cultural heritage, and so on. Compare this with the other accounts, the main essential difference to the content account is that I think there's a difference between a fundamental difference between representing others as mere objects versus representing them as co-subjects of position towards the world. And the capacity to represent others in this way is a form of group mindedness. And the essential difference to the mode approach is that mode is taken to be representational and constitutive for the group's existence, which depends on mutual representations of co-subjects. Like if we jointly tend something to, for us to be a we subject, we must mutually represent ourselves. 
as subjects of this intention. If it's just me representing you as a we subject, but you don't include me in the we mode representation, I misrepresent this and the relevant we subject does not exist. I think in this way we can account for we mode subjects and I would say don't leave group subjects to mysterians if any there are who think that they are somewhat something free floating of individuals and individual minds. And the main difference to the subject approach is that I think there's not only one subject constituting relation like joint commitment or uh, plural pre reflective self awareness, but there are several on such of such relations on different levels and uh, those uh, levels uh, stand in relations of dependence and presuppositions higher level built on lower level ones okay so what is a role uh, what is in particular the difference between roles and identities here some ideas might be that identities are more deeply anchored more pervasive for example being a man one might think this may be deeper than having a certain professional role it pervades all aspects of life and so on is uh, a role perhaps more external and identities more internal one certainly talks about things in this way which uh, su suggests such a difference for example one talks about gender roles versus identity in such a way that the role is something like imposed from society and the identity obviously is not because uh, that's what the person identifies with. But I think ultimately we cannot understand roles apart from people who identify with them. We cannot only understand roles as conferred or imposed from the outside. We also have to understand things from the perspective of the identifying subject. And that's what I will be interested in. I will focus on professional roles in uh, what follows. And I think that's probably not a fundamental distinction between roles and identities, more a matter of degrees. Okay, so how do we get from we mode to role mode and how they are related and how are they different? I think uh, put in a formula, we could say that we mode is egalitarian, whereas roles are non egalitarians because they embody power and competence differentials between group members, whereas the we mode captures the egalitarian aspect, what is uh, the same between the group members. They have in common that both have to be understood in terms of the theoretical and practical positions subjects take in the mode of identification with the group or in the mode of identification with their roles. And for example, uh, this is canonically expressed by things like as chancellor, I believe, as your supervisor, I order you, as your student, I have the right to. Roles are not observer dependent as it has sometimes been put, but I think they are participation dependent. That is, again, the point is they cannot just be imposed or conferred from the outside. And for example, this means for somebody to be a CEO, it's not enough that outside observers or me observers believe this, but the co-workers and the relevant authority must accept this from the position of their relevant roles as employees, employees as relevant government official. In their roles, they must accept the authority of the CEO. And this is not a merely theoretical or observational stance again, but it's an essential practical stance. It includes accepting obligations and powers and the authority of the role bearer. And just like remote representation, role mode representation can also misrepresent. I may represent myself as CEO, but fail to be CEO because relative, relevant others do not represent me as such. Um, and the counterpart to the claim uh, to group mindedness that constitutes group is role mindedness and this uh, role mindedness constitutes roles and role structured groups. Now in the remainder of this talk, I want to discuss the following five theses about role mode, that we in role mode are modes of self-consciousness, 
that one takes positions as a role bearer, that roles are essentially connected to, to theoretical and practical powers and procedures, that role mode explains the structure of role conflict, and that role mode reaches all the way down, that it is embodied and enacted. Let's begin with the claim that role mode and we mode are forms of self-consciousness. I like the slogan that we mode and role mode are both smaller and bigger than I consciousness. Smaller because any we mode or role mode is just one form of I consciousness because I participate in many different groups and typically people have different kinds of roles and also they engage as private per persons in different ways. So any particular we mode or role mode is just one form of I consciousness, but it's also bigger because we consciousness is consciousness of myself as part of, or as myself in a mode of a key identification with something larger with a group. And according the role consciousness is consciousness of myself or of us, because it can also modify we consciousness as when we have something like as committee members, we. And so the speaker identifies with co-subjects and uh, his fellow or her fellow uh, committee members and identify with the role that this group of people has as being a committee. What does it mean? And what are the characteristics of taking a position as a role bearer? The relevant self-consciousness is not introspective. It's not that I look into myself and find out what the position of the groups are or what the positions are that I or we should take as a group member, but I'm looking outside of the world to determine what is the case or what to do in a mode of identification with a group or with a role. And in so doing, I take a position, but take it in a self-aware way. And the position one takes are uh, sometimes role specific. That is their position, for example, that Angela Merkel takes as position as chancellor of Germany versus positions that she takes or took at least when she was still leader of the CEU versus positions that she takes as a private person versus positions that she may take in yet other roles that uh, she has. And why is that? Well, obviously because one takes positions in the light of the values, tasks, obligations, powers, and the kind of knowledge that the role affords or that is connected to the role. Third point, what about the role in its relation to theoretical and practical powers and procedures? Once again, I like the slogan that a role mode may both extend and restrict theoretical and practical reach. In, in that sense, it can make it bigger and smaller. For example, as a judge, I may have knowledge I wouldn't otherwise have because I have a, a, access to certain records and so on that I wouldn't otherwise have, but I may also be unable to make use of knowledge I have if that knowledge is legally inadmissible. And so I can't legally use it in uh, my reasoning and in my determinations. And a, a similar structure is found in, regarding practical powers. I may have access to the power of the organization that I'm a part of, but maybe barred from using personal powers that I have when, again, it's not allowed by the regulations and the procedures that define the role. And so it's an essential part also of role mode that role mode is embedded or connected to such rules and procedures for doing certain things, both for determining what is the case and what to do in one's role. Role mode explains the structure of conflict as a role bearer in a group. It is inevitable and part of the function of taking that role that I must take 
positions I would not personally take or approve of because I'm just acting as a representative of a larger group of people. But of course, this also means there may be deep conflict between different roles or between a position I take in a role and my personal values. So it would be to misunderstand, I think, the role mode idea to think it just sanitizes this so-called sort of conflict by saying, well, I just take this position in this role and take this position in the other role or as a private person and it's all fine. So that's not the idea that uh, the conflict can be dissolved in this way. It's just, the point is just that the conflict still has a different structure if it's just between two positions that I take in the same role or as a private person, it has a different structure. If these are assigned to different uh, um, positions and to different, uh, sorry, to different uh, roles. And I think it's also important because it shows that any kind of conflict I have in this regard ultimately also has potentially at least an influence on what I want to be, whether I still want to uh, take that role uh, and so on. Uh, do we need a special mode to account for conflicts between positions and different roles as for example, I think Otto Leitin suggested uh, once, no, it seems to me we do not because all these are as I've argued ultimately forms of self-consciousness and contained in I mode. So uh, all these conflicts I think must be resolved in I mode. Okay, fifth point, role mode reaches all the way down. So far we have focused on conceptual level positions and reasoning, but role mode reaches all the way down on the layered model is embodied and enacted. So for example, the role structure in a group of animals may be entirely re realized in their sensory, motor, emotional interactions if they lack the concepts. And even if there are, is a layered uh, structure with higher levels, I think it's possible enough that any professional role is also connected to attentional structure, actional skills, what Bourdieu called the habitus, the sensibility, dress code, style, and such things. Okay, final slide uh, uh, sort of summarizes this here. How collectivist or individualist is a subject mode account? It is collective, it seems to me, as insofar as it assumes that humans and some animals experience and represent others as co-subjects. That's just a reflection of the social animals that we are, and therefore show irreducible forms of group and role-mindedness. At the same time, it is individualist because it assumes that all we and role consciousness is a modification of eye consciousness. And that means that a group can only take a position to an individual in a mode of identification with it or with the role it takes. Thank you very much.